Is healing the sick and raising the dead the same thing, and can it be done at any time? Essentially, yes, on both counts. <clears throat> to God, it's all the same. It's just life, basically in degrees. The problem is, when it comes to us humans, we tend to think of it in different light. Because <clears throat> there was another one here that go, kind of goes along with that that I wanted to bring out. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, it says, okay, if you have no eyes, does that come under healing or another topic such as like working of miracles and how do you receive it? Have you prayed for anyone that is like that or similar before? Now, see, what I'm, what I'm trying to get you to is kind of moving past this idea of all of the, the, the how can I say it, the potholes, you know, all the, Speed bumps, all the little things. Bottom line, this comes down to one of two things, or one thing, really. <clears throat> Healing is not a reward. If it is not a reward, it's not given based on whether a person has sinned, not sinned, whether they're good, not good, none of that. So just take all of that. In other words, take the person out of the mix. Do you understand? Take them out of it. When a person stands in front of you or is in front of you and they are sick and they need help, this isn't about them, right? I mean, I know that sounds weird. It is, but it's not. It's about them getting well, but it's not about them as a person. They are no longer a person. They are the sick. They are the oppressed. They are a prisoner of war by Satan. You understand? This whole thing goes back to warfare. That's all it is. Warfare between two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. Now, the kingdom of darkness, the, the human is nothing more than the battlefield. That's all it is. Now, your job is to take the ground. Do you understand that? that I'm giving it to you. If you, could, if you could take that and just grow from that, that's everything you need to know. That's it in a nutshell. That means, now, the prisoner of war is never the problem. Right? It's his guards that you have to deal with. Right? So it's not the prisoner. So you have to get your mind... You, and the reason I'm saying that, I mean, I know this doesn't sound real spiritual, but you have to look at how Jesus ministered to people. He never asked people, how did you get this? He never said, what did you do to deserve it? He never, he never said anything. All he ever says, what do you want me to do? Well, Lord, I want to... You know, receive my hearing. I want to receive my sight. Lord, I want to be healed. Okay. Be healed. Receive it. See that? See how simple that is? He didn't say, well, wait a minute. Let me first see if this isn't an, an act of God. You say, well, that sounds ridiculous. Okay, let me read another one. Exodus 4.11 has long or has been used by significant ministries to say that God allows sickness because God himself said so. Exodus 4.11 that the mute, the deaf, the blind were born that way, that he didn't he make them that way. That's, that's what Exodus 4.11 says. And then in Amos 4.10, it says God uses plagues to turn people back. That's a question. How does this tie or reconcile with, to my understanding of what we're talking about? Now, here's, this is the basic difference. And we hadn't got there yet. I'm trying to get you there, okay? And we should get there today, I'm, at least by this evening. I started on it today. I, I got close to getting there. The difference is you have to understand old covenant, new covenant. Once you get that, it's good. See, you know, the, I hate to say it this way, but if, if when I witness to somebody and if I get them born again or if I'm going to disciple them, the first thing I usually do is I will provide them with a Bible. But the Bible I provide them is always first a New Testament, not an old and new testament. Right? Why? Because we're not going to focus on the old because the old has passed away. Do you understand that? The old, it says the old waxes old. And he said because he said a new, then by saying a new, then that means that there was an old that is no longer in effect or else they wouldn't have made a new. Well, if the old is no longer in effect, then we don't need it to study in at that point. I'm not saying never read it. I will be quoting out of it. You know, it, it, here pretty soon. But 
and I'm not saying just, you know, tear your Old Testament out and throw it away. And I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that the Old Testament is not the Word of God. It is. But you have to realize there are a lot of things that do not apply to you. Okay? I mean, if you're going to hang on to what gives you the right to pick and choose out of the Old Testament what you're going to pick and hang on to? I mean, going, if you're going to use Exodus 4.11, then <laughs> if you're going to be forgiving your sins or you're going to have anything to do with sins, you better be sacrificing some animals. Because you can't go into the law without keeping every, every jot and tittle. You're going to go back into the law. You can't pick out one verse and go, well, what about this? No, 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 no. All or nothing. The Old Testament showed Christ. Do you understand? And it was given until he would come. Once he came, then that was set aside. You know, first off, like I said before, that wasn't even given to you, you know, unless you're Jewish. And that would be to your heritage. But now, once you get born again, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Do you understand that? There, that means there's neither Jew nor Gentile. You're not a Jew, and you're not a Gentile. And I don't care if you're born a Jew, you're still not a Jew. You're not a Jew. There is one new man in Christ Jesus, and that one new man is a new creation. You get it? Well, I'm a completed Jew, I'm a Messianic Jew. No, you're not. Apparently, you're still a sinner. Apparently, you're not born again. Why? Because you're still leaning to the natural lineage. Now on, we know no man after the flesh. The only way you can tell a Jew is by the flesh. If you don't know any man after the flesh, you can't say if he's Jew, Greek, or anything else. It doesn't matter. You understand? If you know him by the Spirit, all you know by the Spirit is light or dark, life or death, dead or alive. That's the only way you know. And if you're in Christ, you're alive. If you're not in Christ, you're dead. You understand that? This stuff is super simple. The reason we make it not simple is because we want to hold on to something. Your struggle is that you try to hang on to the world and God with each with one hand. And many times what that means is, I mean, okay, look, here's how you can tell, real simple. Christianity, how many of you know Christianity is not a religion? Right? It is relationship with God. Now, every religion, you can tell what's a religion. A religion, you, if it's a religion, you can always put ism on the end of it. Right? Buddhism. Shintoism. Confucianism. Right? You can always put an, an ism on the end of those things. That or their derivatives. Christianity. No ism. See, you don't get an ism. Christianity doesn't become a religion until you start dividing it up. Pentecostalism. Episcopalianism. Catholicism. You understand? Christianity doesn't become religion until you start dividing it up. It was a, re it was a relationship with God. Now, I'll give you another one. A religion. Judaism. Religion, not a relationship with God. The Jews did not have a relationship with God. Do you understand? They had the law. And they were the carriers of the law. Salvation came to the world through them because Jesus was one of them and salvation came through him, John chapter 4. You, you getting this? Yep. So when you start going back to the old covenant and trying to say these old covenant things about, well, but God was this and God, you have to realize, number one, God had to deal with men a certain way under the old covenant. Why? Because there was no redeemer. There was no covering. The, the blood of bulls and goats cannot cover for the sins of man. Man was the highest created being God made. Right? So that means that the only thing that could cleanse man's sin would be something equal to man or above him. Everything below him couldn't cleanse him. The animals were below him. God gave man dominion over all the animals of the field. Bulls and goats. So their blood would not cleanse his sin. Why? Because he was of a higher rank. So for him to be cleansed, something of a higher rank had to be sacrificed. Jesus. You understand? So the Old Covenant was based on the sacrifice of bulls and goats, not on the blood of Jesus. Now, that's why the blood of bulls and goats had to be shed every year. Why? Because every year, when they did it again, it reminded them that that blood did not purge their sins, but it had to be done again. So it didn't make the people that were under that covenant perfect. It did not make them perfect. You know what makes them perfect? 
Hebrews says that without us, they could not be made perfect. You know what makes them perfect under the old covenant? Us. Why? For walking in the new covenant. Us coming into this new covenant, then they were looking forward to what was coming. We're not looking forward, we're looking back. They were looking forward to a future event. That's called faith. We're looking back at a past event. That's called a fact. Healing isn't by faith, it's by fact. Jesus bore the stripes. It's a fact. Do you understand? There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's done. Now, the key to this is that the Old Covenant, when you go to the Old Covenant and you start saying, well, what about this? And remember, God had to deal with men a certain way because they were not redeemed. See, all the Old Covenant did with the blood sacrifices was put things off until later, until the Redeemer should come. And when the Redeemer came, the law stopped. You understand? Now, and if you look at this, and I have to get more specific as we go along, but this new covenant made everything different. Under the old covenant, God had to deal with men like fallen men. Under the new covenant, God gets to deal with men the way he's always wanted to, but couldn't. Why? Because before there was something between man and God called sin. Now there's something between man and God called Jesus. You get it? That's the beauty of this whole thing. So when people, that's what is so amazing to me when people always go back to the Old Testament and try to say, you know, God makes the blind. No, God took responsibility for the creation that he created. We say, well, what do you mean he took? See, the problem is we look at this time from, from you know, Adam all the way up to Jesus and we're looking at 4,000 years. So that's a long period of time to us, to God, it's not. So when God says in Exodus, didn't I make the blind? Didn't I make the deaf? Didn't I make the mute? And all that kind of stuff. We say, we say well, see right there, he says he did it. He's saying he takes responsibility. He made man, and knowing what was going to happen, and we know he knew what was going to happen because he made the plan of redemption from before the foundation of the world. So what we would say is, well, he knew it was going to come, then that's wrong. No, but he made the cure for it before the thing even happened. So he took responsibility, and he said, don't worry, I will take care of it. And then he did in Jesus. Now, we don't like it because it took 4,000 years. And so we're looking at all this time. But in reality, he said, I, I, made, I made this thing. It fell apart. I fixed it. I took care of it. Jesus. Now, we want to go back and emphasize when it was messed up. Rather than emphasizing how it was fixed. And the fixing did greater than the messing up. This, we're actually in a better position today than we were before the fall. We're in a better position than Adam. You understand? You say, well, I don't believe that. Okay, then what you actually believe is that sin is more powerful than righteousness. Because you believe that Adam's sin, or I should say that Satan's work in Adam, produced a greater work than Jesus' work on the cross. If you don't believe that Jesus put us into a better position than Adam was, then... We're still below Adam, and that means that Adam, we're still fallen. You understand? But if you realize that what Jesus did was put us, see, the beauty of it is, whenever Adam came, he only had authority over the world. Your position is, you're seated in heavenly places. You've got authority, all authority in heaven and earth is in you, because you're in Christ, and all authority is in him. You have greater authority in Christ than Adam did as the man on the earth. Do you get that? Now, there is nothing to say that Adam had God's nature or character. Matter of fact, we know he didn't because he fell. But we have God's nature. We have his character. We have his spirit. The, the, there's nothing that says that God, you know, that Adam had God's spirit. We do. See, it's better. Do you understand that? Now, our problem is, all this goes back, and it's just really kind of funny when you think about it, because if you walk in power, you really never worry about how people got the way they were. You don't, the only people that really worry about why this, how's that, and all this, are people that can't do anything about it. The people that can do something about it just say, be free. 
I don't care how you got it. Well, you don't understand. I, did, I don't care. Don't talk to me. You might talk me out of it. You know, if I get to know you well enough, I might believe you and believe that you don't deserve it. So just don't talk to me. <laughs> and let me just pray for you, okay? Because I don't care how you got in the condition you're in. That's not important. What's important is I know how to get you out. Amen? Amen. Now, and, and if I get you out, and then I say, okay, be healed. Now go and sin no more. And if you do that, guess what? It won't happen to you again. I'm not saying you got there by sin. Because everything that happens to you isn't because you sinned. Sometimes it's an attack. Sometimes it's sowing and reaping. You know, believe it or not, sometimes it's because you live in a fallen world. Children with genetic diseases. It's not the parent's fault. And it's not the child's fault. It's the devil's fault because we live in a fallen world. There is disease out there. It, it is, see, the, the whole thing is that this world is degenerating. Newton's third law of thermodynamics. Everything has a tendency to run down. You know, which proves that evolution isn't true because they said we ran up. Right? We didn't run up. We're running down. And it's funny because the generation that is always thinks they were the smartest. And yet you go back and say to the Egyptians, they knew how to do stuff we don't know how to do today. They were smarter in many cases. Now, they might not have had some things to work with that we do. But I'll be honest with you, the more we have to work with, the dumber we're getting. <laughs> okay? Is that right? I mean, come on. I, I can't even tell you my wife's phone number. You know why? She's on speed dial. I don't need to remember it anymore. Used to, I had all this stuff memorized, you know? Now, I just, there you go, push the button, right? You know, people don't have to study math anymore. They got a calculator. You know, you ask them, how much is such and such time, such and such? I don't know. I got this. I don't need to know that. And it's funny. We make, we make these smart machines, and we're getting dumber. You see? So, when, but it, it just amazed me because we're so, we want to know how and why. And all that. None of that matters. Live free. Just be free. Well, this, you know, I have this pain. Well, that's not right. Well, can you show me that in Scripture? Um, whatever I ask, he'll do it. Well, that doesn't cover pain. If I can ask for it, it covers it. Right? Well, I want a pain Scripture. Okay. You're a pain in my side. How's that one? <laughs> but do you understand? Get away from that stuff. All it, Paul said, ever learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. We got we got people that'll teach you detail. And now this spiritual root is this, and this takes you back to this, and this goes here. And, and you know what's bad about that stuff? The minute somebody walks, if you go and study the spiritual root of sin or, or of sickness and things like that, the minute somebody comes up and says, would you pray for me? Well, what's the matter with you? Well, I've got arthritis. Immediately. You, you're not a deliverer. You're a judge. Because you just your mind goes through your little book and says, and arthritis, okay, that's bitterness of the spirit. And that's going to, oh, so you're bitter. So you, you just became a judge. You don't know this person. You don't know if they're bitter. You just judge them. You're not a, God never called you to be a judge. He called you to be a deliverer. So quit judging and be the deliverer. Amen? Amen. Isaiah 55 is real clear, or 58, sorry about that. He says, is not this the fast? He said, you, you fast and you do all these things and, and you think you're get, being heard by me? And that's not the fast I've chosen. He said, isn't the fast I've chosen the putting away of the pointing of the finger? In other words, you want to fast something, quit worrying about fasting food and put away your finger. Quit pointing the finger at people. Fast that. Fast judgment. You understand? That's the fast he's chosen. And if you're going to fast food, fine. You make food. Feed the hungry. You understand? That's what this is about. You can't, I, I'm, I keep trying to take you back to, some, to something simple. Love God, love your neighbor. What does love do? Love sets free. Love doesn't hold account of past wrongs. 
read you know, 1 Corinthians 13. Everybody knows it. Love believes all things. Wait, well, do you think he's really changed? I don't know. Let's just wait and see. No, I believe he has. You know, it's amazing. People will rise to the level that you expect of them. You, if you treat somebody like, well, I bet he hadn't changed a bit. I don't know. I'm going you know, to just watch him. You know what? When he gets around you, he'll feel guilty. He'll feel down. And he won't change. Why? Because he doesn't feel like he has any hope. But if you go to him, and even if you see him mess up, you go, hey, <laughs> why are you doing that? That ain't you. I know you. Man, you've changed. You're different. You wouldn't do that anymore. Come on. You know what? They'll rise to that level. They'll rise up to the level of your expectation of them. I, I try to treat everybody like they're saved. And you know what? I've got more people saved that way than, than the other way. I ride on airplanes and I talk to people. People say, so where are you going? Well, I'm going to Australia. I'm going to South Africa. I'm going to Indonesia. Really? What are you doing over there? I look around like I got a secret. <laughs> I put these hands on people and their bodies change. And you ought to see them. They're like, really? And usually the first thing they ask me is kind of like, what, do, do they lose weight? That's the first. <laughs> you know? and, but you just talk to them. And, and I tell them, I say, no, cancer disappears. Blood, high blood pressure disappears. People get out of wheelchairs. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And they're like, really? How, how do you do that? I said, it's easy. Say in the name of Jesus. And it says that's the first clue that they have that this, is, that this is Christianity. And as soon as they hear that, all of a sudden they're like, oh, yeah. yeah. You know, and then, and then all of a sudden they, want, they, don't, they don't want to talk to you anymore. You know, gonna, or if they do, all of a sudden their whole tone changes. You know? yeah, well, then all of a sudden, first they're like, so what do you do for a living? You know, well, I'm a preacher. Oh, well, well I go to the church every now and then, Reverend. You know? I mean, it's amazing. Their whole tone changes, you know. All of a sudden, they're very religious. Every time they mention God, it's a three-syllable word, God, you know. And they start talking that way. And, and I try to tell them, no, it's not that. It's not that. And, and, and I'm, like, I'm like, you've never put your hands on anybody that got well? Well, no. Why not? Well, I, I didn't know. Well, you can do it in the name of Jesus. All you got to do is make him your Lord, and he works through you, and there you go. And all of a sudden, they're like, really? I'm like, see, I just treat it. See, the, you know why people don't receive it from me? Because you act like it's not real. You act like you're ashamed of it. You, you try to hide it. And, but yet, whenever you want to pray for the sick, you want to see them jump out of wheelchairs. You want to be real bold in church, but you want to be a private Christian, secret Christian, you know, on the airplane or in the restaurant. We're not promised healing in church. Mark 16 says believers lay hands on the sick. It says as you go, not as you sit and wait for them to come to you. It says as you go. Amen? It says whatever city you go into, heal the sick therein. In other words, if there's sick people in your city, it's your fault. Why? Because you're supposed to heal the sick therein, in the city. Shouldn't be anybody sick. You say, well, what if they're not born again? It doesn't say go heal the born again. The born again should already be healed, healing the sick. <laughs> right? This stuff is simple. It's light and, you know, light and dark, death and life. And Come on. You just got to know who's in you, what you have. Do you, do you realize that's why Paul talked the way he did? He kept talking about you know, we have this treasure in this earthen vessel. It's amazing that the Spirit of God would live in this. That's amazing. And he's kind of trapped here for a while, you know? And then at some point, he gets free. Amen? And, and you just start realizing that, and you start letting him be free before he actually gets out of here. Why would we want to put him in a straitjacket and have him locked inside of us for 50, 60, 70 years? And we can't let him go until we die. That's ridiculous. He wants to, he wants to live the same life through you today he lived through Jesus when Jesus was here. He wants to live the same life. If it's the same spirit, he can do the same thing. Right? And if you can't do the same thing, what makes you really think you got the same spirit? Come on, I'm just trying to be blunt, all right? This stuff is simple. We could, I could go on and on with testimony. We, I've had, <clears throat> we prayed for two babies. This woman came to our meeting, had 
had, had, she had been pregnant and it was already past her due date, actually right at her due date. She went to the doctor, both babies, no heartbeat, nothing. They said the babies are dead. They, they checked her and I think it was like it had been two weeks. Two weeks, dead babies in her womb. Two weeks. And they told her, they said, well, we can take the babies, but if we do this, it could do some damage, so you should automatically abort, you should spontaneously abort these babies because you've been this long with it, so we're not going to do anything yet. She came into our meeting, sat there, came up for prayer. When she came up, I told her, she told me to pray for her babies, that they told, that they told her that they were dead. I said, put your hands on your belly. She put her hands on her belly because I don't touch women's bellies, so I told her that. And when she did, I put my hand, two fingers on top of her hands. See, you don't have to do things weird. You can do things right, right? I mean, I could tell you stories of people who did stupid things and just draws flack, and you don't have to do that. We get enough flack as it is, right? And I just, I said very simple. I said, the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. That's all I said. God bless you. She went back and sat down. Sat there another about another hour for the rest of the healing service. Got up and was going home. The doctors told her, whenever you feel movement going on in there, you come to the hospital because you'll be starting to abort. And at that point, we'll just put you in and take care of the babies. On her way home, she started feeling movement. She goes to the hospital. They get ready to help her abort the babies. They put all the monitors on her. There's heartbeats. <laughs> I'm serious. There's heartbeats. Within a couple of hours, she gives birth to two healthy baby boys. I mean, now, I now understand, I can't explain that. But I can tell you, we, we've seen nine people come back from the dead. The first one was my daughter. The first one. And to be very honest with you, if it had, she hadn't been the first one, there may never have been another one. You know, there never may have been one. But the reason we had her was because she was, I, I was, now understand, when, I, when she was born, when she was raised from dead, psh, I wasn't ready. I wasn't spiritual. I had problems in my life. I was messed up. But I was heading toward God. I mean, I, I, mean, I was born again, but I'm just, I was moving in that direction. But I was still messed up. Was nowhere near ready. You know, in, in my opinion. And she was in the second floor window up above us. I was sitting at a table. I was actually reading the Bible at the time and studying at a table right in front of the patio. And she was on the second floor, and she, they, they were, she was uh, seven, she was nine. Yeah, she was nine. No, seven. Yeah, seven. <clears throat> and somehow they had raised the window in their room, and she was leaning against the screen and just fell out. Head first, two floors onto concrete. And I was sitting inside, there was a curtain there, and when she hit, I heard, but I didn't know what it was, but I heard her hit the concrete and just, I mean, hit. Head first, she tried to catch herself. When I heard it hit, I didn't know what had happened, but I went out to look. When I got out, when I opened the door and looked out, she was lying face first on the ground with her hands still in that position, literally just laying there because she'd caught herself and it just stuck there. And when I got to her, I picked her up. Her nose was smashed into her face, her head was all banged up, her teeth were pushed up into her gums and she had bit through one lip. Blood was in her mouth. I picked her up. Remember, I'd already buried one daughter. I've been around dead bodies many times in my life. There is a difference between a dead person and an unconscious person. And you can feel the difference when you try to hold them. And when I picked her up, she was dead. No heartbeat, no breath, nothing. Blood was in her mouth, but none was coming out. It was just filled. And I picked her up, and when I held her in my arms, I mean, instantly, I saw the whole funeral of my first daughter. The whole thing. It was like in a second, saw the whole thing. And a voice in my head started saying, you're going to lose another one. You're going to bury another one. And just kept saying it over and over again, getting louder and louder. And I'm walking around with her, and I kept hearing that in my, in, in, in my head. You're going to bury another one. You're going to lose another one. You've lost another one. You're going to bury another one. You're, and just over and over. But I'd been trained to watch my mouth and not let anything but the word of God come out of my mouth. And all I started saying was, in the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. In the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. And she was dead. So what I'm saying made no sense. But... 
Romans 4 tells us to call those things which be not as though they were. It doesn't say to call things that are as though they're not. I don't have cancer, I don't have cancer. I, no, it doesn't say that. It says to call those things that are not as though they were. Right? So what was I doing? In the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. Well, that was the not that I was trying to call to be. I walked around with her for 25 minutes. <clears throat> In my arms, nothing. Her head's back, blood running out of her mouth. Arms back, she's dead. 25 minutes. I kept hearing that voice. You're losing another one. You're losing another one. And I had to get louder and louder with saying, in the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. In the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. And I got louder and louder and louder because I had to get over that voice in my head, which was the voice of the devil. It wasn't my thoughts because I was talking at the same time and you can't talk and think different things. And that was the devil speaking in my ear, but he sounded just like me. Why? Because that's what he does. And then he accuses you of having that thought when he put it there and impersonated you to put it there. And so I'm walking around with her, and after 25 minutes, nothing's changed. So I open up the patio door. I go back inside. I sit her down on the floor. <clears throat> Nobody else at that point even knew what was going on. But when I sit her down on the floor, her head went down on her chest, her arms went down beside her, and I just propped her up against the wall. It was right going from our living room into our kitchen. And I, I, now I, I get down in front of her on my knees and I start yelling, in the name of Jesus, and I point my finger, in the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. In the name of Jesus, that's all I said, over and over and loud. And I started getting louder and louder in there, and then my wife and my other two children, my son and my other daughter, heard me yelling and come running downstairs to see what was going on. When they got in the room, they panicked. Everybody started screaming and hollering and jumping around. They were all young, but they all just started panicking. And it was the strangest thing, because I turned to them, and all I can say, it was like I was in a bubble. I mean, it was so, it was, it was amazing because it was so peaceful that there, was, there wasn't a matter of, I got to get this. It was a matter of, this, this cannot help but happen. And I remember turning to my family and I said, shut up. If you can't believe, leave. And immediately, all three of them just shut up and got quiet. And I turned back to Rebecca and I started saying, in the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. In the name of Jesus, you will live and not die. And I kept saying it over and over again. And after about another 20 minutes, she was dead about 45 minutes. All of a sudden, she was sitting like this and it was like someone punched her in the stomach. She just jerked forward, did like that and spewed blood out of me, all over me. I was right in front of her. And when she spewed the blood out, she opened her eyes and we watched her and it was like watching somebody back here coming back. And she started to focus. She started looking at me. And she, first thing in her mouth said, Daddy, I'm hungry. First thing. Well, I, that didn't register to me at the time, but it did later when I started studying the Bible because every time they raised somebody from the dead, the first thing they said was feed them. Why? Because once somebody's been dead, all their organs shut down. Once you put something in their mouth, it causes the saliva to start running, which actually causes all the digestion system to start, which jump starts everything in the body. And that keeps their spirit connected to their body. See, the spirit comes back to see if it's a viable host. Can it stay or not? If nothing's working, it'll leave. But if it comes back and it stays, because the organs are working, it will stick, and that'll stay with the body, and then they come back. And so I went to the kitchen and got some, we actually had some pita bread there, and I gave it to her, put her in her mouth. She couldn't really eat it because her, her teeth were messed up. <clears throat> but I just put it in her mouth. Then I picked her up and put her in the car, and then we took her to the hospital. That was the first time I even thought about taking her to the hospital. First Thing in my mind. And all the way there, she kept complaining, crying, because it hurt when she was trying to hold herself up. Well, we didn't know it, but she'd broke both of her wrists in the fall. And she crushed her right knee. <clears throat> Just the other day, after we moved, I found pictures of her in the hospital bed with her, all of her cast on and her sitting there, and you can see the banged up head and all that kind of stuff. And so <clears throat> and people say, well, if God healed, if God brought her back from the dead, why didn't he heal her wrist? I didn't ask him to. All I said was, you will live and not die. You understand? So we got what we asked for. Now, that was, the, that was the first one. And that was the longest I've ever had to pray for somebody to come back from the dead. Now, I prayed for other people and they hadn't come back. Right? Like I said, we've, we've, but that was the longest. Every time in the past, every time after that I've ever prayed for somebody, it's been three to five minutes max. And so we've seen these kind of situations. And the only reason I'm saying this is because I want you to realize you got to move beyond the, 
which I would, con- I would really say it was a babyhood stage of the details. <clears throat> You've got to move into just believing God and trusting God and just saying, you said it. Now, I've laid hands, that's done. It's done, it has to happen. Having done all, stand, stand. You don't, you don't back off that. You, go on, you don't go on. I could send you to, to, to lunch here or supper or something like that. <clears throat> but I wanted to, to, to cover these real quick because I want you to realize this. I'm going to get into these details. things. It, it, it seems, you don't have to know that much. All you need to know is that healing is in the atonement. It's always God's will. Jesus paid for it. If I said, is there any reason why Jesus won't save a person? If a person turns to Jesus and says, I make you my Lord, forgive me my sins, or whatever, you wanna, whatever your thing is, however you do it, will God ever turn anybody away? Why? There's some bad people out there. You're telling me if Hitler had said, Jesus, I'm, would he be saved? Why? Couldn't he be too bad? Well, now think about it. If you can't be too bad, then you can't be good enough. Right? Because if you can be good enough, then that means that you could be too bad. You get it? So if you can't be too bad, you can't be good enough. So it has to be by the grace of God and not based on you at all. So if, it's, if, if God will never turn away a person that comes to him for salvation and healing, which I will prove to you, and healing was paid for at the same time and to the same degree that sins were paid for, then the same rules apply to healing as apply to salvation. People say, then, then why can't we just minister salvation to somebody? Because the only difference between healing and salvation is healing requires a change of ownership. Or salvation does, sorry about that. <clears throat> you get it? To get saved, you've got to change owners. Now, I can get you healed whether you change owners or not. Why? Because whether you believe or whether you don't believe makes no difference. I have authority over sickness and disease, no matter what. See, if that's not true, then don't ever waste your time praying for a dead person or praying for a person in a coma. Right? Doesn't do any good. I mean, in other words, if their will is involved, if they have to have faith, then don't pray for anybody that, that is not mentally capable. In other words, people with mental handicaps, forget it. They can never be healed. Why? Because they don't have the mental capacity to have faith or to trust or to accept the provision of Jesus. But we know that's not true. We know people who were healed of mental disabilities. Why? But it was by somebody else usually ministering to them. We've seen Down syndrome. We've seen, you name it, autism. We've seen it all. We've seen them healed. We saw a young boy that had a Down syndrome. I mean, he had all the characteristics of, of Down syndrome. And over a period of a year and a half, two years, even his, the structure of his head changed to where now you look at him and you can't tell he ever had Down syndrome. He went from a five-year-old mentality up to his rightful age. Back when I, when I knew him, he was 21. You see? Now, understand, most of these things, I wouldn't even say I had anything to do with. I just got to be the you know, privileged to be there and things happen. I can tell you other stories the same way. But the bottom line is, all God wants is somebody he can work through. Somebody they won't say, well, yeah, but. Well, God would like to, but no. You know, I'm not ready. God says, well, I was going to use you till you said that. You disqualified yourself. Jesus qualified you. Don't disqualify yourself. Because, well, I'm not good enough. I hadn't fasted enough. I don't, those aren't rules he set. Don't you set them. Because all you're doing is disqualify. Well, I just don't know if I have the faith. How dare you say that? You don't know if you have the faith? Faith, what? In, what, in God? And what you're telling me is you can't trust God? God is not worthy of your trust. That's what you're saying. Well, no, I'm saying I don't know if I have enough faith. In, in, faith in, see, it's not faith. It's not the question. It's what you have faith in. If you say you don't have enough faith, you're saying that God is not trustworthy. This ain't about your faith. This is about God who is faithful even if you're faithless. You understand? That's what this whole thing is about. See, we've made faith into a uh, currency. Well, do I have enough faith to buy healing? No, it's not about that. It's God. He's the object of your faith. 
Faith shouldn't be the object of your faith. You don't need faith in your faith. That's humanism. You need faith in God. And he is faithful. He's worthy to be faithful. Amen? He said, well, I, but I wanted details. I wanted, why do you want details? You know, the, the details I can give you, guess where I learned them? By doing. I didn't have anybody tell me. I learned it by doing it. Now, I'm going to give you details, I, you know, because hopefully it'll get you there faster. But all I'm saying is, that it wasn't the details that makes it work. It's you deciding to do what you're supposed to do and not quit until you get what you came after. I mean, come on, think about it. We're all, we're trying to convince God to do it, and in reality, Jesus goes through, and this woman says, uh, Lord, my daughter has a devil. And Jesus said, well, it's not right to give the children's bread to the dogs. He just told her no. Why? He said, because I'm not sent to the, the, to the Gentiles. I'm not sent to the, but I am sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In other words, look, God made a, a covenant with Abraham, and I have to fulfill it, so I have to go to the children of Israel first. I'm not to the Gentiles. I got to do this. So he tells this woman no. Now, was Jesus the voice of God on the earth? Yes. So God told that woman no. And you say, well, I don't like that. That means he could tell me no. No, he can't. Can't tell you no. Why? Because all the promises are in him, yes, and in him, amen. So be it. He can't tell you no. You know why too? Guess what? Now it is to the Gentiles. Right? Now you're part of the children. Now this is the children's bread. So whenever you look at that, the, he just told her no. And this woman should have said, well, if God said no, so be it. Thy will be done. If it be thy will, Lord, heal my daughter. No. Okay. But that ain't what you see. You know what you see? Lord, even the dogs get the crumbs. In other words, I ain't leaving here without it. I heard what you said, but I'm getting it. I mean, think about it. God says no, and she says, no, that ain't good enough. I think I'm, and then he turns around and says, you got great faith. Why? Because you didn't take no for an answer. Most people, you say no, they go, okay. But see, when I raised my daughter from my dad, I wasn't going to take no. No wasn't even an option. I never even thought of stopping. People say, well, how long would you have done it? I'd still be there today. You know, it'd be a mess, but I'd still be there. Right? Why? Because I'd already lost one. I wasn't going to lose another. God gave me my kids to me. He didn't give my kids to doctors. He gave me the responsibility for them. And I take that responsibility, and I've never turned them over to doctors since. I've done everything we need to do. I've prayed. We believed. We did what we had to do, and we have never lost another child. You understand? We've had situations go on, and God has seen us through every one of them. Why? Because I just won't quit. I hate to lose, and I just won't back down, especially if this book tells me I'm not supposed to. Now, I, and understand, I don't have anything going for me, and, and if there's any reason why God does do stuff for us, it's just because we don't quit. So if you don't get anything else, just get perseverance, get that tenacity, get that grit to just dig in and go, no, the Bible says this, and it will be this no matter what. And you just keep on plowing through. And anything gets in your way, if you ever hear no, it's a devil. Do you understand? Because God won't say no because all the promises are in Christ, yea, and in him, amen. So if you hear no, it's not Jesus, it's not God because they say the same thing. It's a devil. So just refuse to take it. And when you do, you watch what happens.